Jean-Luc Saman, uh, welcome to BRI Dialogues. Uh, for the sake of our audience and getting them a bit familiarized with your impressive background, I quickly go through your bio and background. Jean-Luc Saman is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council of Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative, focusing on Middle Eastern strategic affairs and the evolution of the Gulf security system. In particular, the Israeli and Hezbollah conflict. Currently, he serves as a senior research fellow at the National University of Singapore's Middle East Institute. Prior to that, Jean-Luc was a policy analyst at the Directorate for Strategic Affairs at the French Ministry of Defense from 2008 to 2011, research advisor at the NATO Defense College 2011 to 2016, and associate professor in strategic studies detached by U.S. nearest Southeast, South, nearest South Asia Center to the UAE National Defense College from 2016 to 2021. Jean-Luc's most recent book, co-authored with Frédéric Grave, is The Indian Ocean as a New Political and Security Region, which looks at the geostrategic environment in the Indian Ocean region. Jean-Luc is a former student of Arabic at the French Institute of Oriental Languages and French Institute for the Near East in Beirut, Lebanon. He graduated from Institute for Political Studies in Grenoble, holds a PhD in political science from University of Paris, Panthéon Sorbonne, and has accreditation to supervise research from Science Po Paris. And a man of multi-languages, covering some of the hottest issues. So I'd like to kick off by asking you, Jean-Luc, we're in 2024, on the verge of US elections, the world behind is already over. As we're speaking, Kazan is the center of attention. BRICS Plus are gathering in Russia. If you had a crystal ball in light of all of your expertise with the Middle East conflict as well, what are the dynamics at the macro level? And then we funnel down and we come a bit to the ground. What sort of a world you anticipate through your crystal ball where you're sitting with BRICS, the new world order, and unraveling disorder in you know West Asia or Middle East, and the ambitions of China at large in this context? Well, I mean, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to join you for this uh, dialogue. Uh, and uh, we start right away with uh, an exciting but challenging question. Uh, and this is uh, this is uh, my crystal ball. So uh, uh, it's not better than uh, any other crystal ball uh, by definition. The, the impression I have is that we tend, especially as you mentioned, the uh, the un upcoming elections, we tend to uh, maybe uh, overestimate the importance of individuals in uh, the um, in the in the evolution of the international system and in particular of the Middle East. Uh, uh, we may, for different reasons, think that. Uh, if Kamala Harris gets president, it would be better than if uh, Donald Trump uh, gets elected. But I think it's mostly because we can more or less predict what uh, Harris would be as a president. It would be much more difficult, actually, to imagine what Trump would do, uh, especially for the Middle East. He's been very vague on Gaza or on most topics, actually, uh, that is that are uh, in the air right now in the region. So it's mostly uh, because we don't know what Trump would do that we think uh, Harris would be better. Uh, but if we put aside, the, let's say, the individual factor, I think uh, it's actually easier to see that there are trends uh, which have been uh, ongoing for a while, which uh, I think relate to um, the uh, rapprochement between, let's say, the Middle East and Asian countries, economically, diplomatically, much less so militarily, and maybe we can talk about it later, uh, but uh, we see more and more uh, the Arab countries, and in particular the Gulf countries, being uh, ambitious, being vocal about their relations with uh, Asian countries. And at the same time, you have uh, 
any American president, uh, let's say from Obama till now, and probably that will be the same with Harris or Trump, uh, focusing or at least trying to focus more on Asia and Europe because of Ukraine uh, and at the expense of the Middle East. So, And I think this is not something that will change in, in, in the coming years. The Gaza war, and in addition to that, the Lebanon war now, uh, give us the impression that the Middle East is back to where it was, which was at the top of the agenda during the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the era of the war on terror. I don't think that the next US president, no matter who that is, will uh, keep the my Middle East as the first priority. My, my bet in this crystal ball is that we'll see Asia uh, Asia Pacific in particular, and Europe because of the, uh, the the war in Ukraine as the top priorities. And clearly, this is also bad news for the Middle East because I don't think, unfortunately, that we are going to see a big uh, diplomatic momentum for a peace process be it with, between Israel and the Palestinians or be, between Israel uh, and the other countries uh, surrounding it. Uh, you know, look, that's a very, very interesting start for us. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I have my doubts about this pivot to Asia that Obama coined. My view is, is that actually there is so much strategic interdependence across Eurasia that is very difficult to com compartmentalize these theaters. Um, no matter what happens uh, in the Levant, the fact remains the United States is, is committed to some kind of an order or semi-order in this part of the world. And it is almost impossible for them to delink from this region in order to build in Asia, because the two are so closely linked. But also the fear that if they delink from this region, uh, the brewing conflicts between Iran and Israel, for example, the tensions with the, around Saudi Arabia's interests, and of course, if they go with the Chinese moving, with the Russians consolidated and so on, are always also in the background. If you look at all of this national strategic assessments with each president, they never overlook these geopolitical dangers, these potholes that are there. So on what basis do you think America will be able to successfully pivot towards Asia, where as we speak, you know, the Americans are on another round of diplomatic uh, kind of shuttles have you seen Russians shuttling? Have you seen Indians shuttling? Have you seen Chinese, even Europeans shuttling the way the Americans have? Doesn't that tell you that actually, you know, the US is the only dominant game in town and the region knows it and the Americans know it? Well, I mean, and there are, there's a lot to, uh, to unpack here the, in the sense that I mean, first, as a Middle East researcher, obviously, I agree with you that the Middle East should still be the, the priority. But the and the, the pivot itself was, I think, a misleading uh, expression uh, from the Obama uh, administration that they very quickly, uh, um, very quickly changed. If we look at the diplomatic and the military engagement uh, right now in terms of the military footprint, in terms of the... Uh, the importance of diplomatic meetings, visits, uh, I mean, between the U.S. and its uh, uh, its different regional partners, uh, that the Asia and Europe are still the priority. The the Middle East again came back uh, because of October seven, and suddenly there was um, a, a pressure that the, the the Biden administration could not escape, but. Prior to October 7, uh, if we look at the way the White House was uh, treating, managing the Middle East, it was mostly a few diplomatic arrangements, uh, but nothing which was really dedicated to ambitious projects like uh, the peace process. Or uh, the, So the most... The, the biggest project was the normalization between Israel and the Arab uh, Arab states. But that that was it. Uh, so my concern is that the moment we have, let's imagine, 
uh, one or two years from now, we have uh, a ceasefire in Gaza, a ceasefire in Lebanon. Uh, I doubt we'll have a permanent settlement between, let's say, Israel and the Palestinians. As long as we have uh, the current government in Israel uh, and different uh, different issues also within the Palestinian factions, but also within Lebanon, I, I don't I just don't see how uh, the Americans would get involved uh, right now. And as a result, I think we may go back to, let's say, a situation where we we just manage the conflicts in the Middle East while we focus on what's the priority which is Asia, which is the challenge with China, which is also a bipartisan a bipartisan goal. So that's also the reason that adds to the to the fact to the incentives in the sense that in DC these days it's easier to get approval when you talk about China than when you talk about Israel Palestine. So I think the next president will also be looking for that type of um, um support uh with congress so for very different reasons probably in terms of uh internal politics and also the the regional uh, priorities i i still believe that in coming years uh the asia and europe uh are going to be the um the uh, the priorities having said that on the other end and as you said i mean it doesn't mean that when you're Israeli or uh, Saudi or Emirati, you think that China will replace the U.S. That's actually also why it's going to be more volatile in the region, because the U.S. may decrease its interest, but that doesn't mean that uh, China uh, will replace the U.S. So it only means that the local actors will have more agency or more responsibility and we already see that to a certain extent since uh, October 7 the fact that the US has not been uh, willing or able to uh, constrain uh, Israel's uh, military operations and as a result we see that if the US is not uh, playing that role there's just no other alternative the the Chinese are not interested and the Gulf countries are not even contemplating that role so that that i think might be one element that could actually uh, be uh, uh foreshadowing uh, another trend for the middle east jean luc in uh, 2023 at golf international forum you touched on the fact and you said quote all of that will create a big mess for uae and bahrain post abraham accords which was very uh, interesting way ahead of your uh, everybody's time as a prediction in light of what's happening, do you think that the GCC finds itself in a predicament that is attracting foreign direct investment from China, becoming a larger partner? In the meantime, they may overplay their card because they still need the security umbrella of the United States. And how will all of this play in this so-called India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor with a government that is sitting in Israel at the moment from a BRI point of view where we are looking. So how do you see realistically, because for many, I mean, you're an expert on military issues for many at the battlefield level, the uh, Ukraine um, war is by many analysts is over, finished, frozen. It can be a frozen conflict. So does that mean the Northern Corridor will be again viable for BRI? Is this the end of India, Middle East, Europe and Haifa port, which was a major nod in IMEC in light of, you know, um, the way this government is operating in Israel that may be a pariah for the global south? Or do you see that IMEC is still a viable alternative or challenger to BRI? Well, I mean, several things that come to my mind for those uh, questions. Um, and first of all, the, the, the big challenge when we talk about the GCC is that you have basically six different countries with very different uh, strategies. So I could not give you uh, uh, one answer that fits uh, them all. The So far... They, I think the, the Gulf countries, and in particular, I, I, I would argue the UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, are trying as much as possible uh, to maintain their policy of keeping good ties with China in all different aspects, 
involving even security um, sensitive uh, domains while having good ties with the US. And it's it's still working. There are some limits. We've seen that uh, over the last year with the UAE announcing that it would stop its cooperation in the field of artificial intelligence uh, with Chinese entities. Um, and but apart from that, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the the trade volume, if you look at uh, the different aspects uh, of that cooperation, uh, the Chinese are not leaving uh, the Gulf. So that's one uh, major element. The second thing is that they are still able to get close to the U.S. and uh, the visit of Mohammed bin Zayed to the UAE uh, at the beginning of October. And the announcement that the UAE would become a non-NATO uh, major, I think, defense partner, that was the, the label they used, uh, was also a signal that the UAE, after years of uh, tense relations with the Biden administration, uh, is now back being, uh, a, let's say, a reliable partner in the region. And that, I think, tells us that on both sides, there have been some uh, adaptation. The uh, the Gulf states, and in particular, the UAE may be more aware of what are the red lines that the uh, Americans will not tolerate when it comes to cooperation with China. But also, I think the Biden administration also adapted because you remember when the Biden administration started in January 2021, one of the first decisions was to suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And there were some very tough rhetoric uh, coming from the Biden administration uh, that related to China, related to uh, the, the, the Yemen war. And later on, they changed, they adapted mostly first because of Ukraine, uh, because they needed uh, Gulf support uh, as an alternative for Russian energy. But I think it also relates to the fact that the Biden administration realizes that there are aspects that uh, it cannot uh, it cannot change in the the Gulf uh, policies uh, when it comes to uh, the Gulf uh, rapprochement with China. There's just a fact of life in a way, uh, and that's something actually that you see elsewhere. Uh, that you can see, for instance, in Asia and in particular in Southeast Asia, where you have countries which are still close to China in terms of trade but which are getting closer to the U.S. in terms of uh, military security cooperation. So, again, I think it's a case of mutual adaptation. How long it can last? Uh, in the case of the Gulf, I think it's more sustainable maybe than in Asia, where uh, a conflict between the U.S. and China is, is something which is perceived as a much more concrete uh, scenario than in the Gulf, where this is still very difficult to imagine a scenario where the US China confrontation spills over in the Arabian Peninsula. Yeah, ab ab absolutely, absolutely spot on. I'm not my MSC, I'm, I still want to have your opinion. Yes. Uh, that's, oh. You're being naughty, you're dodging my ball. I, I know Anush wants. No, no, sorry. I, on uh, on uh, IMEC, uh, uh, and it's on my paper, so I didn't forget um, the question. Uh, it's it's interesting, and uh, I, I'm tempted to use again the crystal ball here because um, I make uh, if if we have, for instance, a Trump presidency again, I I, I doubt that um, the the new White House will use uh, I make uh, as an expression because uh, any new administration always wants its own acronym, so they may change and create something different. Uh, so the the risk is, and even Harris, I'm not sure uh, Kamala Harris would be really fond of uh, a project like IMEC. The, um, there's a lot of uncertainties uh, in terms of the technical aspects of IMEC, plus the diplomatic uh, timing didn't help. The fact that it was held uh, in September, like a few weeks before the, the war in Gaza started. So as you said, um, IMEC uh, works under the assumption that uh, Israel would be one uh, element or one player of that uh, new uh, road between uh, South Asia 
the Gulf, uh, and eventually Europe. But right now, for diplomatic reasons, but also for security reasons, uh, I'm not sure uh, the Gulf states uh, are interested in connecting their projects, their infrastructure projects to uh, Israel. Uh, so I I might be wrong, but right now I, I feel like uh, the IMEC project uh, is no longer really at the top of the rhetorical um, priorities of the Biden administration or even the um, the Harris uh, team. But again, this might be rebranded. Uh, I don't think this means that um, cooperation between Israel and Gulf, Gulf states uh, will no longer be seen as a, a important aspect of US policy in the region. But we may see IMEX through a, a new name uh, that is different and maybe less, I mean, maybe something more realistic because IMEX, when you read the uh, initial project, it's um, it's so vague in a way uh, with lofty objectives that it's very difficult. And I remember ask, asking people from the private sector that tend to be... Uh, maybe more down to earth uh, than researchers who are fascinated with grand strategy, most of them were struggling with the logic of the project. They, they just couldn't see first who was going to finance this and how does that make sense to connect all those uh, different projects? So the again, the, we may be uh, uh, proven wrong uh, in one or two years if there's a new project, but right now, I make as we know it, I I fear might uh, just uh, vanish after uh, Joe Biden leaves the White House. Yeah, you, you've dealt with, with Ali's question beautifully, Jean-Luc. Nice, nicely done. I've, I've got a couple for you. Um, one relating to India and one relating to China, but a different spin from what Ali's put on it. Uh, so let's assume that that um, IMEC is dead, and that was kind of part of in India's strategy of, you know, infrastructure geopolitics game. Now we have the war in Ukraine that China is directly uh, engaged with. We have the crisis in West Asia that United States is directly engaged with, and in the Levant. Um, and we talk about Chinese American rivalries in, you know, Indo-Pacific, let's call it, but we are silent on India. Where does India sit in this geopolitical mess? Where to its north, it's got its major military partner at war. Uh, to its east, it's got this power, which is now peer with the United States. And to its west, where it was, it was beginning to make inroads with the GCC, with Iran and so on. All of that seems to be unraveling where India sitting on its hands. Where, what is, you know, how do they prioritize their interests? And let me pitch the second question as well. Uh, the second one relates to China. So let's assume that China says, all right, you know, India as a geopolitical or infrastructure rival is gone with IMEC being, being uh, frozen indefinitely. And, and, and while Russia is at war, I'm not sure that they'll be able to resurrect the middle corridor in any case, because Europe remains very resistant to that arriving in European Union territory. Putting that aside, China's other pawn, of course, was shifting stuff through Iran and then across maybe uh, Anatolia. But Iran is itself part of this geopolitical mess. So if Israel was India's Achilles heel in its ge geopolitical infrastructure development, do you think Iran is China's Achilles heel? That's an interesting uh, analogy. Uh, uh, and um, there's... There's, there, there might be uh, some elements uh, that explain the, uh, let's say, the limitations in both cases. Uh, the uh, the fact that um, both China and India have uh, have partnerships that uh, can prove to be liabilities uh, in the region. Uh, 
problem is that actually India also has relations with Iran. I, have, I had that in my mind, the fact that uh, India just doesn't have uh, good ties with Israel. In this case, they also have this uh, um, this enduring relationship with, uh, with Iran that probably also uh, uh, is an issue for them. Uh, the, uh, with regards to India and the Middle East, uh, what's interesting to me is that to a certain extent the um the uh the prospects and the limitations of india in the middle east are very similar to what you would see in other sub regions where india is a major actor in this and what i mean by that is that india for instance has been um engaging with southeast asia for the past two decades it has been one of the, the key uh, foreign policy goals, uh, the look east policy at the time, the idea of a diversification of India's foreign policy, uh, except that very quickly, when you look at the, the trade volume, when you look at military cooperation, uh, it's challenging for the Indians to compete with China. Uh, and I think it's the same in the Middle East. Um, I remember I I lived in, in in the UAE for five years, uh, and the year I moved to the UAE was the year when uh, Mohammed bin Zayed was invited to the uh, India's Republic Day, and that was a major major thing. I think 2017, maybe if I remember correctly. And at the time, the big talk was the that India was uh, getting more serious about its relations with uh, the Gulf countries. A year later, so 2018, Xi Jinping visited the UAE and suddenly you could almost see it uh, on the ground how the volume of Chinese investments was just dwarfing, was overwhelming anything that was expecting with India. And, and I know that it's been very difficult for Gulf investors also to get involved with India's infrastructures projects. Uh, there are uh, a lot of projects, but it tends to be much slower than what they can do with China and so on. So that that certainly um, uh, explains why uh, almost a decade later, India is is less uh, is not where uh, we could have expected. The other aspect also is uh, it's what's interesting is how India was used or expected to be a, a, a major player by the US in the Middle East because we we just talked about IMEC. Uh, India was also part of uh, the I two U two initiative, so the India. India, Israel, United Arab Emirates, and the U.S. What's interesting is how the Biden administration tried, some in some ways, to to um, to uh, emulate the Asia model to the Middle East, where India was its let's say its um, regional partner or its sparing partner in the Middle East, the same way it was in Asia, and. Same issues. The fact that India uh, is is sticking to its multi-alignment uh, policies, wants to keep good ties with Israel, Gulf states, and Iran. Uh, well, that means that it's actually undermining, in some ways, what the Americans would expect. Um, and one, I mean, just uh, one, aneg not anecdote, but uh, one element from the news, which I think perfectly uh, captures uh, this Indian logic in the Middle East. I, if I remember correctly, the day or maybe the day before uh, Iran launched ballistic missiles on uh, Israel the last time, so in October, uh, you had Indian warships uh, coming to uh, Iran. This was not uh, because of uh, the, uh, this was coincidental. This was the unfortunate timing of uh, naval visits. But that tells you a lot about how uh, the Indians have no trouble so far 
keeping their um, their ties with Iran, investing in Iran while deepening their security cooperation, their tech cooperation with Israel. Uh, so that's uh, for India. With regards to China, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll I'll try to make it short, uh, not to uh, to talk too long, but the 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 main the main talking point of China in the Middle East before October 7 was uh, let's do business together. Uh, we're not the Americans. We're not here to do security. We're not going to uh, uh, destabilize the region. We believe that prosperity, mutual prosperity is good. That has been the main talking point. That uh, And that is a compelling argument uh, in the Gulf, even in Israel to a certain extent, that was a compelling argument. The problem is that this has limitations in the sense that the Chinese were basically dismissing any of the security issues in the region. They they made statements about uh, the Palestinians while um, investing in the Israeli startup uh, environment. They didn't have any trouble uh, getting Huawei uh, in Tel Aviv while making statements about the need for a two-state solution. So at a certain point, the the talking point uh, is artificial, especially now that we see that the, the Chinese are not really interested, and I don't think they even have the ability to um, to facilitate, to mediate between the different actors. Uh, they've done that between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and that didn't really bring more than, let's say, uh, the Houthis not attacking the Saudis in the Red Sea. But beyond that, that didn't bring any um, improvement in the regional uh, environment. So I think this may also lead to a reality check, uh, again, from the local players that they are on their own, that the U.S. is no longer really interested or that the U.S. is only interested in supporting Israel, which might go against the interest of some of those Arab states. And at the same time, the Chinese doesn't really want uh, to play that uh, mediation. So this might be uh, hopefully uh, a reality check that leads to countries, in particular Saudi Arabia, to be much more ambitious about regional affairs. Jean-Luc, I want to take you to your area of comfort and uh, expertise, which is world-renowned, and that is conflicts and military. If there is an October surprise, and there is a full-fledged conflict, God forbid, between Israel and Iran, um, that will lead to massive issues in energy markets, and China still relies heavily in, on the Persian Gulf and the sources of you know, energy. And an October surprise should come with, I would say, a November reconstruction. <laughs> So all of these war-torn countries, whether it's sadly Lebanon now and, you know, Palestine, Iraq still, Syria, there is this anticipation from uh, the government in Israel that our friends in GCC can build it up like a nirvana and like Disneyland. Would GCC pick up the tap, you think? Would China tolerate a full-fledged war in these calculations? And just to... This is a comment. This is not a question. I don't see much of a difference in all sincerity in China's position in the conflict resolution uh, at the moment um, than the lip service of United States to, you know, two state solution or peace process. You know, as a matter of fact, they're a new kid on the block. And if they can bring economic incentives, maybe there is hope for China to do something. But my key question remains for you an October surprise which I call it an October tragedy, because that would be another level of you know, uh, heartache, and also the reconstruction. Should GCC pick up the tap? Will they, in light of what happened and the context of what has happened? And what are China's calculations in the bigger picture in a post-conflict era? Okay, with regards to the, uh, the question of an October surprise, I, I, I'm not sure this... Uh... This is still uh, going to be uh, in October because, as we we speak, we have only a few days left for the months. So uh, the and I, I don't know how close this could be from uh, the election or not. The uh, my concern right now is that 
especially in Lebanon, we see the um, the, uh, the Israelis, uh, in a way, tempted to to go for uh, something much more ambitious than they initially declared. Uh, they uh, at first launched uh, the operation in uh, Lebanon with a concrete specific goal, much more concrete actually than uh, in Gaza, which was to um, put an end to the, uh, the, the rocket attacks uh, from Hezbollah on uh, Israel's north uh, and to make sure that you have the residents uh, from uh, the northern cities, villages of Israel that can go back home. And to a certain extent, I think they reached that goal. Uh, right now, uh, it seems that Hezbollah, from what we hear, uh, is interested uh, today in a ceasefire uh, that would be disconnected from Gaza. In the past, Hezbollah refused any uh, discussion of a ceasefire uh, without a precondition being uh, a first ceasefire in Gaza. They are no longer connecting the uh, the uh, the issue of a ceasefire in Lebanon to the one in Gaza. So you could argue that the Israelis have met their objectives. But my fear is that we are in a moment where the Israeli government and Perhaps the uh, military establishment is uh, overconfident, uh, has seen how they were able to disrupt uh, Hezbollah, to, the, to target uh, Hezbollah and Hamas leadership. And also, and that brings Iran into the equation, if you look at it from an Israeli standpoint, uh, they are also very confident that they control the logic of escalation with Iran that Iran uh, initially was in a position, a much more favorable position because it was using non-state actors uh, indirectly against Israel. And it felt like the Israelis could not uh, retaliate against Iran directly, except that the Israelis have been able step by step to completely change the logic. And now they, uh, I think they feel they feel like they are in a much better position in terms of escalation dominance with Iran. Uh, so that leads to the uh, the surprise. Uh, I, I I cannot say for sure, and um, I don't want to sound ridiculous if people watch the the video uh, in two months from now with a if I give you a, a very specific uh, scenario, uh, but. Again, the, I think the, my my concern is the um, the overconfidence uh, from the Israeli uh, perspective, and perhaps also from the American uh, parts of the American uh, system, the American administration that might be thinking it is the momentum, it is the window of opportunity to change uh, what's happening in the Middle East. Um, now, with regards to Israel's expectation from the Gulf states, and that's an interesting. Uh, a interesting development and i i have the impression when i talk to uh the israelis are not all the israelis i don't want to make generalization but a lot of israeli observers tend to underestimate the the level of frustration the level of anger that has been brought about by the gaza war and it's as if they they, they still think that the moment there's a ceasefire, everything can be resumed and that normalization with Saudi Arabia will happen in the next months very quickly. And that it only takes the Saudis and the Emiratis to invest into Gaza and that's it. And I, th I think it's probably a convenient way to escape difficult questions uh, for them, which relate to the fact that... Um, uh, Saudi Arabia, for instance, has to deal with its own domestic uh, reactions to uh, the Gaza. And there's also the fact that Saudi Arabia may not be tempted to invest economically or militarily in Gaza. I mean, Saudi Arabia had uh, suspended its investments into Lebanon uh, a few years ago, so I doubt they would be... Um, they would be suddenly changing their uh, rational just for Gaza. Uh, so it's it's actually uh, fascinating how Israelis, for different reasons, tend 
to overestimate what they can get from the Gulf states on Gaza. Uh, because for different reasons, again, I think the, the Gulf states uh, don't want to please the Israelis on that. And they are also very reluctant to lose money uh, on uh, the Palestinian issue uh, from a purely realistic uh, standpoint. And also, I mean, if we're talking, if we're imagining a post-conflict situation, because there were discussions about why don't Gulf states provide peacekeepers or let's say an Arab uh, military force that would be reconstructing Gaza. Uh, again, this would be, I mean, I don't see right now um, Gulf militaries uh, having either the appetite nor the know-how, which is maybe more important, the know-how to do this type of uh, mission. So for all of those reasons, I think it's also going to be a very messy situation with regards to the reconstruction of Gaza. Yeah, yeah I, I, I see Ali's got his mic unmuted, so I'm going to jump in. Uh, no, I Jean wanted to say if Jean UN is not uh, tolerated, I doubt that, you know, with under the current context, uh, a Gulf force would be, real, you know, uh, tolerated as well. So, but that's... Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think your analysis of, you know, the the current dynamics is is spot on. And, and you know, when you talk to uh, Gulf elites, they are really annoyed that everything they built in Gaza has been destroyed. Hospitals, universities, schools, health centers, infrastructure, everything that they put in many billions of dollars into constructing to make Gaza a livable place has been flattened. So to persuade them to do it all over again, as you rightly say, is gonna be a really hard sell to their own domestic constituents who, who are rightly wanting some return on, on the foreign policy of these countries. And and also, I doubt very much that these countries will mobilize in a way that would appear to be against Iran around the Levant, as this might, this might appear to be, while keeping Iran sweet and, and, and quiet. So, yeah, I mean, the way that you've unpacked it is, is spot on, John Lu. But in that context of, of what you've been saying, I, I see that basically, the axis of resistance has been defanged. It 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 is really got it's got a fig leaf, uh, and and that is what the, the Israeli establishment is capitalizing on. That's what the Americans are capitalizing on. That that you know it's now the time to push Iran right back to its own borders. And arguably, some Gulfies would I would also like to see that to to if you like liberate the Levant from the clutches of Iranian uh, proxies and so on. Um, so isn't that a point of, if you like, strategic conver convergence between Israel, US and some of the GCC countries who maybe reluctantly, maybe quietly would like to see Iran kind of cut down to their size rather than the side that Iran itself would like to see? And speculatively, what do you think Iran's reaction might be? But don't feel that you have to answer this latter question. Uh, well, I mean, the and uh, the, the I mean, regarding the first part of the question, the the possibility of strategic convergence uh, that that was the one of the initial motives behind the uh, Abraham Accords and uh, uh, more broadly the normalization process between Israel and the Gulf states. The idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, um, and to a certain extent, I think. Uh, Emiratis or Saudis uh, um, have no, I mean, they, they are probably pleased to see uh, Hezbollah and Hamas being uh, destroyed, degraded, uh, and so on. But at the same time, uh, I think when, when, I, when I talk to the, 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 the people in the, the, the region, there's also a lot of discomfort with the rhetoric coming from the Netanyahu government, um, because this would have been probably very different if uh, this was a government that, I mean, I'm talking about the Israeli government here, that was um, 
considering the uh, the concerns of uh, its regional partners. But Netanyahu, and in particular his uh, far-right uh, allies, has made sure that he, they were completely ignoring uh, Saudi Arabia uh, positions or even the UAE. Uh, and by extension, I also think that the Emiratis and the Saudis are looking at how the Israelis are treating the Americans. They see how even in the case of the U.S., even in the case of uh, President Biden, who uh, started with the um, the approach of uh, hugging Bibi, the idea that uh, if you express um, strong support publicly, maybe privately you can get uh, something from the, the Israeli government. Even in this case, probably the Emiratis and the, the Saudis are seeing that the, this Israeli government uh, doesn't care about how it treats its closest ally. So this, I think, also puts them in a tough spot in the sense that, uh, in and I should add that in addition to uh, ignoring the concerns of the regional partners, Netanyahu also doesn't mind having the rhetoric of um, the far right uh, for resettlement in Gaza, uh, and even in the case of uh, Lebanon, having uh, uh, soldiers uh, raising the flag, the Israeli flag, uh, on uh, Lebanon's territory, no matter how much the Gulf states want to weaken Iran or any proxy of Iran, they don't enjoy having uh, Israeli far-right members, Israeli settlers uh, projecting their own projects of expansion uh, on Arab territories. I, I think that's that's uh, a red line uh, for any Arab country in the region. So I think that's unfortunately uh, for, let's say, the uh, Israeli center, the Israeli moderates that want closer ties to the Gulf states, that's a red line. That is also one of the reasons why the Gulf states are not going to be very active at the moment on uh, reconstruction of uh, Gaza. Um, and then in the end, this may also uh, play, I mean, this also may explain why so far Saudi Arabia and, uh, and the UAE have been careful uh, with regards to their relations with Iran. Because a few years ago, a scenario like this you would have seen uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, if we had imagined a war like this during the Trump presidency, the first Trump presidency, uh, maybe the UAE and uh, the Saudis would have been uh, openly assertive in pushing for uh, operations on uh, Iran. Today, they have been very careful. Since October of last year, they have been very careful. They are trying as much as possible to disconnect the Israel-Iran tensions uh, from their own issues. And I think it's because they are not comfortable with the uh, uh, the uh, ultimate goal, if there is an ultimate goal of the uh, Israeli strategy. So Jean-Luc, that... I, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on its head. I just wanted to um, make a short comment with a twist of question and then take you to the final two questions. I ask all of our audience just to get into the hour. And that is, we're talking a lot about GCC, Israel, you know, United States, and we forget that today in Kazan, the global south is sitting there. And in the eyes of the global south, you know, when, when these calculations happen and the tragedies that are taking place, they say, well, wait a minute, Qatar has been funding, hosting, how come Hamas in Doha, how come Qatar is not being whacked the same way as Iran is being whacked? So what I'm trying to say is that there is much more in the global calculation of the global South perspective, that six and a half billion, seeing these things on their screen and saying, maybe we need a new framework for everybody's safety and security. And I wanted to just nudge that in for a question for our next gathering, but normally we bring our sessions to an end. Um, and if you like to expand on the global South position, you're more than welcome. But I always ask our guests, Please do. Anush is saying, please do. 
So, so your comments on global South, forget US, Israel, and GCC. I mean, you know, Brazil, South Africa, China, you know, the rest of the world, even India to that extent. I mean, their foreign minister is very vocal these days. And what are your two parting shots as two pieces of advice to cinephobes and cinephiles in these times? What would you tell the cinephobes and the cinephiles in context of China's role in all of this and your take on Global South? Because Anoush was saying, yes, you have to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, wow. Okay, that's uh, uh, that's again uh, a very challenging uh, set of questions. The I, I tend to be uh, skeptical about the the idea of the global south. Uh, and I mean, just to go back to the the question of uh, Qatar, uh, because uh, in the case of Qatar, it's uh, it's not an issue of double standard. It's just that uh, the the Qataris. Uh, the Qataris uh, hosted the Taliban because the Americans wanted the, Amer the Talibans to be in Qatar. And then Qatar uh, sponsored Hamas, uh, as it has been well documented, uh, with their implicit or explicit sometime approval from the Americans or the Israelis. So it's it's easy, in a sense, on this specific case to explain the, why, uh, why in the case of Qatar, this was not an issue. The... And I think uh, the going back to global south or the China question, the what's interesting right now is that I mean, for instance, India is probably uh, the uh, the counter argument to uh, the global south uh, uh, metaphor, the idea that uh, there's a global south uh, that is. Um, angered by the Western uh, policies and wants to move on from uh, that. India is part of any type of uh, arrangements with the Global South while deepening its ties with uh, with the, uh, the US or with France uh, or uh, any other uh, countries. I mean, so it's, it's very difficult to... Um, to apply this logic of the global south uh, to one of the biggest uh, powers of the global south, mm. and even China. I mean, to a certain extent, I think it's China doesn't play through that. Uh, the Chinese foreign policy doesn't really uh, play through that uh, through that lens. So, I mean, to to go back to your your question, and I don't have like a definitive answer. Uh, I think to the uh, to the people who are uh, let's say the China hawks or the, the the China doves, the the thing is that China is not going to uh, disappear. Uh, the question is to define how the, in particular, in the Middle East, you what type of red lines you establish uh, when it comes to your relations uh between the two major powers the us and uh, china and the answer to that really depends on your own national capabilities your uh your ability to protect your own sovereignty uh vis-a-vis -vis any external right. power the, be it the Americans or the Chinese. Uh, and so I think when you're a small state uh, in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East or anywhere, uh, you cannot, you don't have the luxury of ignoring the global powers. But what you need to do is to assess how far you can go economically, militarily, diplomatically with those countries without uh, undermining your own sovereignty. And what's interesting for us as analysts is that the answer will be very different if you're, for instance, Djibouti, or if you're the UAE, if you're Israel, uh, or if you're, for instance, uh, Greece. Uh, so that's, that's I think, uh, that would be my answer uh, to your question, yeah. Such a wise head on such young shoulders, Jean-Luc. You are <laughs> absolutely electrifying. You are, uh, you, 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 you've been as extraordinary as we knew you would be when we invited you to join us, Jean-Luc. So it's been a real pleasure to to hear you. Uh, we throw questions at you left and right, north and south, 
and you've you've been remarkably brilliant in unpacking them and giving us really smart, thoughtful, and analytically rich answers, which is what Global Dialogues uh, wants to have and and aspires to. And you've you've met all our expectations. So we are really grateful to you, Ali and I, for taking the time, for being so generous with us, and also for giving us such interesting insights from your personal experiences, in addition to your vast reservoir of knowledge and analytical uh, prowess. So thank you very much indeed, jean Um and, and, and I'm sure that our audience will enjoy conversation with you as much as Ali and I have. So thank you. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Thank you for being with us.